So we come off the lock, and you can see we bring it down. They all come down, and once right. we pull this vehicle out, oh, there's a light nice underneath catch. the rig. <laughs> How about we move that light? Hey guys, it's Cam with Craft and Tailored. In this episode of The Details, we're hanging out with our friend Matt Farah here at his facility on the west side of Los Angeles called West Side Collector Car Storage. Matt is a world-renowned automotive journalist as well as podcaster who started a series on both YouTube as well as a podcast called The Smoking Tire. We're here to tour the facility and we're of course gonna talk watches. Let's go in and meet Matt, follow me. Matt, up, buddy? how Welcome. you doing, man? You Good to see you. Cars? Let's go take a look. Come on in, this is the spot. This is the view, right here, this is what we pay for. Ready? <laughs> oh. oh yeah, baby. So Matt, you have, I would say one of the things that I admire most is that you've kind of ridden this awesome wave of like DIY media. You sure. know, I think that that's one of the things that I think is so cool is like, you know, anybody can, can do this and I think you're a perfect you know, we're talking now about your podcast and what you've done within, you know, automotive journalism and media to not just doing that from like a professional perspective, but literally making your passion your profession, which is something sure. that I've done. So I want to talk well, to you a little bit the better. other way. Okay. I, I made videos first. Okay. And then got a magazine job. Got it. Afterwards. I made my first YouTube video in November of 2006. Okay. Which was the year that YouTube launched. And so I had a car wash with my friend in New York. Once we figured out that YouTube was a thing, we were using YouTube to promote our car wash. You know, that transitioned into me talking to a mic about, about cars and being a, a sort of a face. And I quickly realized that there was an opportunity there. At the same time, in those early days of YouTube, TV casting people would start to look to YouTube for talent. So we used the early days of YouTube never as an idea of this is how we're going to make a living. Here's how we can have an updated ongoing audition reel for TV. TV is not all it's cracked up to be. <laughs> and with YouTube, you can make good money doing what you want to do, but it's an open source platform, right? So right. anyone can do it. And then the real turning point was when I figured out that taking advantage of both the medium and my one skill. And my one skill is that I can drive pretty fast while talking about almost anything <laughs> for 20 minutes straight, right. uninterrupted, and not sound stupid and not crash the car. I guess I, that's, that's a, a talent. talent. If I yeah. have a talent, that's it. Other people necessarily <laughs> can't also do that. And so I capitalized on it and flood the market with these videos, which worked for a while until I got burnt out. Yeah. Fortunately, around 2010, our friend Chris Hayes convinced us to start a podcast. In 2010, I was like, why would we start a podcast? Everyone's already got a podcast. That was dumb. But that was how I felt then. I feel like podcasts in the past like three to five years is, have like picked up a lot more steam, which sure. is kind of interesting because- well, radio sucks. Yeah. Talk radio certainly people sucks. people want to listen to what they want to listen to. Right, well, we're in a world now of people either want a TikTok video or really dive into a slow, long form conversation. You know, for me, much like you, I've taken my passion, turned it into my full-time gig. Right. I'm still buying, selling, authenticating, verifying watches every single day. Right. You know, my passion lies in like sharing that with people that have yeah. a like mind. And that's what ultimately keeps my passion and my interest in these kinds of things, as I'm sure, like, you know, it's like, how many Lamborghinis have you driven? How many, you know what I'm well, saying? I mean, look, reading car magazines is what got me into cars before I could drive. I never thought, that I would be the person writing that. But the open source medium of YouTube got me well known enough 
that those magazines came calling. Right. Now I get to write for Road and Track Magazine, which is the magazine I read growing up. And as it turns out, even though I do a podcast, even though I make videos and those are fun, writing for a magazine actually is the most rewarding thing I do. Because when I'm doing videos, I have to do it now. And if I get home and forgot a thought, well, it's not in the video now. Podcasting is like radio on my time. Right. <laughs> you know, it's pretty cool to go drive a car, make some notes, gather my thoughts, go off on a bike ride and let my mind go wild and then come back with a, an overarching metaphor for what I've done. I find that process to be incredibly rewarding. And also like because of YouTube and podcasting and whatever, I get to be this much of a celebrity. You know what I mean? Sure. And that's fun. Yeah. I go to the mall and no one cares, but I go right. to a car show and I get to be famous. Like that's, that's cool. That's pretty fun. It's rewarding. I can, I can choose when to be famous. I think this is like common between what I do and what you do is that you actually like live your passion. Sure. We're here at Westside Collector Car Storage because after 12 years of the gig economy, the you're only as good as your next video, your next podcast, your next- What'd you do for me today? What have you done for me today? I correctly, I believe, observed that I could not keep that up indefinitely. And so I looked for something a little more stable. What is stable? Commercial real estate is stable. Rental property or rental income is stable. Yep. And also what did I need in my life? Well, I had a growing collection of cars and I live down by the beach in Venice and where space is limited. And I thought there might be some other people like me. And so I started this business um, by building what I thought could be the best possible building I could build in an area where most people said I couldn't build. Right. And and it would be too hard and it would be too annoying. Right. They were right. It was hard. It yeah. was annoying. It was frustrating. It was expensive. There are better ways to earn a living. For sure. But because I could put this beautiful studio here, because I could put my office here, because I could have press cars delivered here and have fans stop by if they wanted to see something cool. And now uh, I'm able to, if I want to, maybe not make that video, maybe skip that week of podcasting. For sure. Maybe say no to certain things that five or six years ago, I wouldn't be able to say no to. And oh, by the way, I have a beautiful building full of really cool cars. You yeah. Know, most of which aren't mine, but I still get to look at them and enjoy their presence. Totally. Yeah. You know, I have my own collection of watches. Yeah. But, you know, also like we have beautiful watches all the time. So yeah. I can kind of like wear whatever I yeah. want. It's weird for me because I almost haven't been able to wear my collection as much anymore because I'm meeting with somebody who's looking at me as an advisor and then I'm advising them on a purchase. But what are you wearing? Well, that happens to me all the time. People go, well, what would you buy? Well, I'm not you, you're not me. Totally. If you live in Colorado, uh, <laughs> outside of Vail, and are driving in the snow, up and down mountains with no, you know, what I would buy is, would not work there. Right. What would I do? I'd buy a 1988 Lamborghini Countach. Does that help? <laughs> you know what I mean? What we would personally do with our own collections, be it watches or cars, is not necessarily good consumer advice. Not at all. Or even good enthusiast advice. Folks will come up to me and say, you know, because of your review, I bought this car. Well, I appreciate that. But what about the people who saw my review, bought the car, and then hated it? Right. I, I don't know if I want that kind of pressure. <laughs> well, I think it's the other way, too. I'm learning new stuff about watches yeah. all the time. And there are other people that I would consider experts, even though people consider me an expert. People consider me an expert in watches, and I'm far from it. I did a podcast called The Watch and Listen Podcast for a year. We did 50 episodes. I did it with Cameron Weiss, and it was great fun. I reached a crossroads of I need to either get much nerdier about the engineering right or much snobbier <laughs> yeah in order to continue but yeah. i don't want to be the person responsible for relaying with cars. that information yeah. it's like i know enough yeah but not to the point where i would consider my an expert i'm an enthusiast no. i like how they look i like how they feel i am totally okay admitting when a watch is a trophy <laughs> i have no problem with this at all yeah like oh you're just wearing that to show off yeah Exactly. Yeah, I am. What's it to you? <laughs> you know, I like to say that a watch is like a sports car that comes into the bar with you. 
God, that's great. Yeah, <laughs> with my cars and my watches, I want them to be engaging for me to use, fun, I want them to work. There's no paddock perpetual calendars in your collection. Right, and I also <laughs> want it to be the kind of thing where if I roll up to a car show, people go, wow, look at that. Right, if it's not accessible and fun and you can't connect right. with somebody else, then what's the point? Right. So before we dive into the watches, let's go check out the garage, maybe uh -huh. do a tour of the facilities. Uh, we can the do the tour. Yeah. All right, let's go do that. So welcome. Thanks for having us. This is where we do what we do. Yep. We call this the cathedral room. There's a lot of firsts in this building. Cars are cool, but I've become a construction nerd because <laughs> I built this building from the ground up. Yeah. It took five years. So this room, which is about 9,000 square foot room, holds 90 cars. It's amazing. So we've got 18 Park Plus quad stackers. They're tandem, they're too deep here, too deep there, okay? Our ceiling is 45 feet. The stackers are 38 feet. They're exoskeleton designs. You gotta have exoskeleton, you wanna see what's in there. Well, basically it's for structure. So they're oh, all tied together. So you have this giant steel cage, right? They make two versions of these lifts, California and everywhere else. So we're the only people in the world that have a quad stacking system with battery tending going all the way up to the top tray. No one has ever put this many quads in, indoors before. No one's ever put quads indoors in a seismic zone before, and no one's ever put quads over a basement before. So we've done all three of those things. I think that's just one of the things that makes this facility almost like a work of, of art, you know? Well, it's a work of engineering art, and it's fortunate that it ended up being sort of beautiful from an engineering yeah. perspective, but that was deeply secondary. For sure. You know, so each of these trays all the way up can hold 6,000 pounds, 17 feet long, and seven feet high. So think Chevy Tahoe. Over here, you've got a big Rolls Royce and a Lamborghini Aventador. That's too wide and the Rolls is too long. So our lifts are run by these big uh, 20 horsepower motors. There's three of them. There's one back there. Got it. And two over there. Do you want to see how one works? Yeah, let's go All check right, it let's out. Go, let's go run this one. We've got locking mechanisms here that the cars rest on. And the trays nest into each other when they're lowered. They're yeah. so thin, they like literally stack yeah. up on each other. Well, they're meant for low profile cars. So, Porsche GT3, lovely car. It's owned by one of our most enthusiastic members. She keeps four cars with us and uses them all the time. Race tracks, canyons. About 25% of all the cars stored here are Porsches. Yeah. Second most popular would be Mercedes. Third is BMW. And then muscle cars would make up the, the last fourth. Interesting. And then there's some really random stuff too. One of the most interesting things that I've learned from running this place is that what people will pay to store their special car is totally disconnected from the value of that car. $6.99 a month to keep a car here. So on that math, it might be like, well, if it's not a Ferrari, like why bother? Why but right. we have cars that are worth as little as ten, twelve thousand dollars What is that, a 99 Boxster? Yeah, there's a Boxster, there's an Audi TT. I mean, look, we've got a Lexus SC430, but these cars are special to their owners. Right. And we treat them, you know, the same as we would treat a four or $500,000 car. I think there's a lot of crossover between the car collecting community oh, yeah. and the watch collecting oh, yeah. community. Yeah. And I think you're a great example of that because we'll look at your collection in a little bit, but I mean, you have, everything from the high end to like the fun stuff. Yeah. And whenever we get together, I'm like, what are you wearing? And so it's always something that's interesting and cool. I've been through those phases. <laughs> All of where them? <laughs> you, I, I, there's the thing I wanted when I was a kid. There's the thing I might have bought because I because everyone else said it was cool. Right. And then there's the thing I've got where I was somehow involved in the process of creating it. And they have their own types of satisfaction. So totally. Let me show you some of my favorite cars around the shop. Cool. I'll put this Porsche back. So now we were talking about some of the cars here and there's obviously a variety. I mean, this is obviously a fan favorite. Right. You know, McLaren 765 LT, the best. Can't really beat that in the McLaren category. One of the gnarliest, fastest, most insane supercars that you can buy today. But it's not really what I'm into. I'm glad one guy's got one, <laughs> but it's not where I want to spend my money. So come over here. This up here is the 1986 Ferrari 328 GTS. Everything I love about, you know, Italian motoring, right? First off, 
Ferraris are awesome in black. I love a Ferrari that's not red. Gated manual transmission, high revving V8. It's not so powerful. You know, that McLaren, you, you have to be going 150 miles an hour right. to approach the performance of what that thing can do. Whereas my Ferrari, just everyday stuff, is fun. You know, it's fun at 55 miles an hour. It's funny, like when I'm in my 75 911S that has a bit of a hot rod motor in it, but like going 30 miles per hour in that car yeah. is just as fun as going Right. Every time I drive a new McLaren, I go, they sell this to people? This right. is insane. <laughs> so let me show you some other stuff yeah, I'm into. Check it out. We obviously love things that have fine, almost unnoticeable details. And I think this car is kind of almost comparable to like, you know, a Submariner having like a Tiffany stamp on right. it or something like that. Right, so this is one of my favorite cars and I'm sorry that we're in a dark corner, but this car lives in a dark corner. This is a 1986 Mercedes uh, 560, six liter wide body AMG Hammer. It's got a full AMG body and AMG interior. And of course the very famous um, six liter engine. It's incredibly rare. Right. Uh, there's fewer than a hundred of these ever made historically significant, right. enormously beautiful, somewhat under the radar, especially in a dark gray color like this. Yeah. It's probably over $400,000. Yep. And if you drove it around the street on Nobody LA, one out of a hundred yeah. people might know what they're looking at, maybe even less. So this is one of my favorite cars here. Let me show you another one of my favorite cars Let's go here. Let's check it out. For some more obvious reasons. This is a Ferrari 550 Maranello from 2001. Uh, front engine V12, manual transmission in a non-red color. Yep. And these cars are great for a couple of reasons. They're modern enough that you could literally daily drive this car. The V12 Ferraris of this period are really, really reliable. They're a little bit under the radar compared totally. to the V8 powered cars. To go back on Ferrari's history, if you go back to the 50s and 60s, yep. they didn't start doing the mid-engine V8 cars like this 458 behind us until later. So this really is what Ferrari's history has led to. This car, if I was to make a watch analogy, would be like a Rolex GMT from like 2000, 2002, yep. where it's tough, you know, it's got that classic look, but with some modern materials totally. in a more modern size. Yeah. You wear it every day, you go in the ocean with it. Use it, but not feel like you're everybody else. Correct, you yeah. don't have to super baby it. That's what I like about uh, about my cars and my watches. Yeah. Non-traditional color combinations and, and usability. What if that's gonna change? Now, if you want a Ferrari that's not red, you will pay a premium for it now. Right. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, for but back sure. in the day, that switch, and I think that's kind of interesting, yeah. like with the watch world, right, where like bezel patina or a dial going tropical, people didn't want that at, at a certain point, and now it's desirable because it's well, less the, of them. In the car world, for a long time, impeccably restored. Right. But something can only be original that one time. That's totally. why I'll never do full restorations on my own cars. And, and that's why I think it's it's better if you can to not do a full restoration on a on a watch. For yeah. sure. Yeah. You yeah, wanna yeah. go talk about some watches? Let's go do that. All right. Let's check it out. Good car. So thanks for giving us a tour of everything. I really okay. appreciate you having us. Yeah, thanks for talking about my shop. Really cool place. If you guys are in the neighborhood, I'm sure. Come by. Yeah. Westside Collector Car Storage, Playa Vista. Yeah, cool. So let's you talk watches. Some watches. Yeah. Let's start with this, because so, when you first got this, I was like, that is so sick. Two things I love in this watch. I really like Seiko watches in general. Me too. And also you know? they're heavily customizable. When I first started learning about the world of custom Seikos, totally. that was where they really got interesting for yeah. me. And you have a few custom Seikos. I have about five custom Seikos, yeah. but this one is my favorite because this one is not actually based on a base watch. So this was built by a guy named Namir out of Toronto. His Instagram is N Horology Lab. I basically wanted my take on a yacht master right but from a seiko but the real thing about this watch is it has a tahitian mother of black pearl dial i remember the first time i saw you wearing this we were to cars and coffee and i was like whoa what is that yeah you know and that's kind of the fun thing about like modding in the seiko world is like you know would rolex really ever do this 
Probably not. These Seikos are so fun. You can yeah. be cheeky and silly, and at a glance, it looks like something Rolex would make totally. with a fake Yacht Master bezel on it. But this dial is it's spectacular. Yeah. Most people who ask me about this watch are serious collectors of very expensive right. watches. But I made a deal that I would share this guy's talents and his creations, but he would never make another one just like that. And so this piece, I think it was, you know, under $1,500 all in. It's And you've killer. got a killer piece that's got all the flash of a gold watch, you know, but it, but you know, it's not precious. To that end, this is my latest acquisition. I remember getting the text message on this when I was like, I was like, yeah. yep. So then this is the real deal. Yep. This is a, a 2002 Rolex Daytona in gold, and it has a Tahitian mother of black pearl dial. I traded another watch for this, Yep. and I, th I think I made the right move, because when this showed up, I was like, oh, yes! <laughs> um, and I'm really excited, because this is just the logical extension of my obsession with Tahitian Pearl. Yeah, I was excited that you brought both because this yeah. one I really liked a lot. And then when you got this, I was like, all right, I yeah. see the natural progression yeah, there, yeah. which is cool. And then this one I brought out because I talked about, you know, wanting to, like with the Seiko, my involvement in the process I enjoy. Right. And this is a, a Weiss American Issue Field Watch made by my friend Cameron Weiss right here in Los Angeles. You know, people are like, what can I get that's special and mm -hmm. cool and also high quality? Mm -hmm. I'm, I like recommend Weiss stuff. These are fabulous. All the time. They're I mean, so cool. He, he designed this movement when he was, I think, 33 years old. Yeah. And what's great about this one is it's a one of one Bugatti French racing blue dial. It's stamped on the back, just one. That's uh, so not sad. even one of, just one, but also to have been involved just a little bit right. in the process of, of picking the color and, and that kind of stuff, yeah. to me, is very special. So. It's really cool. There's two more watches I want to I wanna talk about. All right. What do you um, want to talk about? This is kind of how you and I started This is the together. first one we worked together on, so yeah. this, is, this is really cool. On the surface, this is a Rolex Deep Sea. You know, they don't individually number anything except the rare occasion where they do a collaboration with some type of elite military unit. Yep. In 2013, that was the Royal Navy Clearance Divers in the UK. So they made 50 of these, and they have a special case back. Yep. They're individually numbered, and there was a clearance diver named Mark, who was the only clearance diver to buy two. And I bought both. This is so rare that I didn't think it was real. You wanted to end on this? I did, yeah, okay. because this is also a collectible. My dad bought a Submariner for himself in 1990. Okay. Wears it every day. Growing up, you know, I watched him wear it, and I didn't know about the collecting community, the enthusiast community, and the nuances of any of it, but I knew that a Rolex watch was a high-quality item. When I left New York to move to California to start the smoking tire, he and my mother gave me this watch. And this is a Rolex Kermit Submariner yep. with a green dial, 50th anniversary. 16610 yep. LV. So I wore this every day for 10 years in the desert, you yeah. know, filming cars. I'm up in the mountains. I was in the ocean. and, and You put and, it through its paces. Yeah, and it was just my watch. And then when I met uh, my friend Spike Ferriston, Spike was really the first person to be like, do you know why this is special? And so that conversation got me on the road of appreciating the little nuances totally. from one to another, which is sort of how I started to become an enthusiast. And around that same time, I uh, I decided that I wanted to stop wearing the watch that my father gave me and buy my own yep. nice watch, which I did. And, you know, you know, now here we are. Yeah. <laughs> um, and that <laughs> one turned, thing leads to another. That turned into say. a lot. So now instead of wearing it to work, I wear it to cars and coffee. Right. I wear it. It's now a special occasion watch. I'm sure you just put that on and you're like instant comfort. It's go. Yeah. Yeah. But we talk about like all these things kind of leading into one another. And this is the first watch that had the maxi dial and hands right before you see it in the ceramic. Right. Not a lot of people know that. And yeah. the fact that you wore it and got to enjoy it and it's kind of reached that yeah. level is so cool. I'm glad I didn't know it was that special at the time. Right. I might not have done all those things. For you know? sure. And so, you know, now my everyday watch is the is the current generation GMT. On Jubilee. Yeah. And, and I treat it like garbage. <laughs> you know what I mean? I yeah. think there's more value in buying something nice and using it and enjoying it than there is in just having a collection and not, you know, I drive yeah. my old cars. Yeah, same. You know, I, I, I try to do that. So that's 
anyway, that's my watch collecting philosophy. Thanks for sharing that with us. Thanks I really appreciate me. this. Um, so for those of you out there that don't know Matt, Matt is basically out there at the smoking tire. On the smoking tire, everything. YouTube, everything. podcast, Instagram, Facebook, the smoking tire. Not yet. Patreon. Oh, Patreon. Patreon. Nice. Nice. Yeah. Kidding. Sorry. Do you want me to do another one? <laughs> no, leave it. <laughs> oh, that's great. <laughs> So um, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe. If you guys have watch questions, we're here and happy to help. Drop us a line at info at craftandtailored.com. Instagram is at craftandtailored, and we will see you guys in the next one. Mm -hmm.